Wow. We, we really do love uh, Sarah and Christo. They just find a way. They really do. They just find a way to meet the need, and they tell us about it. They involve us. And uh, so over and over again, we're able to support the work of God in, in, um, in South Asia through them and what they're doing. So that's just really an exciting story. And thank you for giving. Thank you for your financial support to Kingdom Builders. It's so good to know that as you're sitting here, your reach is literally around the world. Isn't that good? Isn't that encouraging? You know, we can't go. Like, we're not going to jump on an airplane right now. Uh, we're not going to go to India. But our resources go much farther than we could ever go. And uh, just along those same lines, I want to just uh, bring to your attention that we are now in the month of October. It's almost our, our anniversary. It's almost our 98th anniversary as a church, 98 years. And um, we always do a uh, October special offering called Heart for the House. And um, it's connected to Kingdom Builders in helping us with what we do in local church expansion and so on. But I want you to now be thinking about Heart for the House. It's coming. Our special offering will be the third week of October. And so if you can begin to prepare yourself for that, it's an over and above giving opportunity to give uh, to the house for the work that we're doing here and, and uh, what we're doing on the project. So we'll be giving you some updates on what's going on in the facility and what we're attempting to do. So I just want to say hello to everybody watching online with us as well. So good to have you here with us. This is week number four in our series that's entitled Homecoming, and I'm kind of wrapping the series up today, but we're not done with Nehemiah. It's kind of, we've kind of, you know, we're going to get to the place where the wall is rebuilt today, but then next week, um, we're going to start with another layer of sort of the heart behind the story of Nehemiah, what was motivating them, what was in their hearts as they were building, as they were preparing. So it's going to be a fun time in the series. So we're going to stay with Nehemiah, but where we are right now is we're we're going to get to the point where the wall is rebuilt. And, and we've been making a parallel between the rebuilding of our lives and the rebuilding of the wall uh, in Jerusalem through the story of Nehemiah. We've also been kind of connecting that to rebuilding the church and many of the things that we're attempting to do here at the church. And so there's a lot of connection points here. I just want to be very clear. Not everything is rebuilt at GT Church. Not everything is rebuilt. It doesn't just take four Sundays for us to be back, but God is working, and there's wonderful stories of things that are being rebuilt. Pastor Chris talking about 100 new people in small groups. That's, those are signs of rebuilding. God is doing a great work through his church. We're going to talk about the concept of doing a great work today. This week, is a little bit crazy. We're going to be in chapter six, and it's sort of like a soap opera with all kinds of backstory. There's a murder plot. There's all kinds of really exciting, intriguing things that happen in chapter six. And so we're going to be looking at that. Just let me catch everybody up very briefly. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king of Persia, so he had a place of influence. He, was, he asked the king if he could go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall around the city so that they could be protected and safe, and he was given that permission. He traveled the thousand miles. He starts the rebuilding. Um, there's a great swell of support. There's an exciting you know, sense of, of teamwork. They get the wall half built. They start to have opposition and they grow discouraged, but we're going to be in chapter 6 today, and we're going to see sort of the end of the building, the completion of the building. It says, when the word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, this is verse 1 of chapter 6, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab. I'm just going to stop for a minute because I introduced you last week to the three antagonists in the story. The three people, uh, I introduced you to two and I'm bringing in the third today. Two people who were standing against Nehemiah and his rebuild. One was Sanballat, one was Tobiah, and now we see the third. His name is Geshem the Arab. So let's keep going. When the word came to these three, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates. I'm gonna leave you on a cliffhanger right there. We're gonna stop there for just a minute. What did we just read? He's almost done. 
he's like really making tracks. I mean, he's got the, the wall completely re rebuilt, no gaps left in it. The doors are not quite in place yet, but he's almost totally done. And here's what I want you to think about. The closer that you get to God's goal, the harder the enemy will fight to stop you. And that's a truth. That's a truth because it's something that we have experienced over and over again. It seems like that last little bit of the marathon, the heartbreak hill at the end of the marathon. I remember that back in 2007, last time I ran a marathon. And, and I remember getting to that point where it's just like, oh, you hit the wall. I mean, there's a sense at times that the opposition intensifies as you come to the close and you receive the opposition not because you're doing something wrong, if you remember from last week, but because you're doing something right. This opposition is right there in your face. And so for some of you, you know, it's like you're getting ready to go to small group and all of a sudden your kid becomes sick and you can't go. Or you're, you know, um, the classic one is you're married and you're on your way to church and you have a big fight and then you sit down to worship God, right? How many of you ever had that experience? Yeah. And I've told you a solution. I've told you this before. I'll tell you again. Lisa and I never, ever fight on the way to church because we take separate cars. It works great. I mean, we're not going to fight on the way to church because we're not even in the same vehicle together. You know how it feels to be coming to the end. You're kind of getting to the end of the goal, but it feels like it's really intensified. It's really hard. It's really difficult. The closer that you get to the goal, the harder it feels like it is. And that's that, you know, final 10 pounds that you're trying to lose, but then there's that tub of ice cream in the freezer. It's just so hard. I want to talk to you about two strategies of your enemy and what he will attempt to do in order to stop you when you're almost done. Almost done, getting so close to the goal and the enemy intensifies the fight against you. The first thing that we see in the storyline here is that your enemy will try to distract you. Distractions. Uh, we live in a culture of distractions. I don't know that it's ever been easier to be distracted. And the truth is, is we have begun to orient our lives around literally enjoying, expecting, waiting, wanting a distraction. We, we actually engage the distractions. We want them in our lives. And you know what? The truth is, distractions are a tool of the enemy. Look at verse 2. Sanballat and Geshem, that third guy, sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. And I can never preach this verse without saying, you should never meet anybody in a place called Ono, right? Right? bad idea. Don't do it. Don't go there. It's not going to go well. But their goal here was to distract him. Let's kill his focus. Let's pull him out of the work that's almost done and bring him into a place where he's totally distracted and unable to do it. And most of us are smart enough when we're engaged in something not to let something big take our focus. But it's little things, you know, it's the little distractions that become the big distractions for us. It's the, the dripping faucet, the ticking clock in the living room. It's the sitting down to our computer only to have our phone ding about some sort of Facebook message that we got and begin the scroll. You know what I mean? The endless scroll. It goes on. It is how deep is the rabbit hole? I don't think any of us know. You can scroll forever, right? I mean, and sometimes it's good things that are distractions to us. Sometimes it's good things like being on a board and contributing or volunteering in an organization or something of that nature or getting season tickets to the Royals because they're back again, right? I mean, it can be good things that can become distractions for us. But like Nehemiah, we have to also refuse distractions. We have to refuse them because they will be plenteous. There's no doubt about it. And so Nehemiah said something, I'm going to ask you to say it with me. He said, I'm not coming down. Will you say that with me? I'm not coming down. If you're with somebody sitting beside someone, look at them and tell them, I'm not coming down. They'll have no idea what you mean, but it's great. You just tell them, I'm not coming down. Let's look now on into Nehemiah's story. But, about the plain of Ono, oh but... 
They were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project and cannot go down. I'm not coming down, he said. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? I'm not going down to the plain of Ono. I'm going to stay up here where the work is. I'm not going down into that distraction. I'm going to stay up here where God has called me. I'm not going to deviate or dive or submerge myself in something other than what it is that God has called me to do. I'm not coming down. I'm carrying on a good work. We're not coming down at church. We're going to keep on going. We're going to develop leaders. We're going to launch small groups. We're going to help people take their next steps. We're going to reveal the life-giving message of Jesus. We're not coming down. And for you, it's the same. You want to start that new outreach. You want to disciple your kids. You want to be a financial leader at GT. It takes focus. We have to refuse to be distracted. Can I get a good old-fashioned amen? Oh, I felt very hearty. Thank you. I appreciate it. I feel encouraged when you do that. Um, So one of the thoughts here that we've actually been discussing as a staff and, and even in our family, and I'll explain that in just a minute, is this idea of could doesn't equal should. How many of you know what I mean by that? Just because I can doesn't mean I should. And this has been, for many, many people, can equals should. Partially because other people expect it. Well, you can, so why won't you, right? But the idea of can equaling should is a trap that never ends. Hey, could you do this for me? Yes, I could, but should I, right? I could do this, and I could do that, and I could do this other thing, but should I? We're talking about distractions here. We're talking about the enemy's plan to distract us, and what we've been discussing as a staff is the idea of the discipline of restraint, and the discipline of restraint doesn't just mean I keep myself from doing bad things. It means just because I could doesn't mean I should, right? This is the concept. I'm carrying on a great work and I can't come down. I mean, if Lisa was preaching today, she would say, I'm still raising our kids. I'm pastoring alongside of Andy and I have to look after him, which is two full-time jobs. I cannot come down, right? We've been trying to help us rebuild. You're right here with us. I feel it. I sense it. We're doing it together. But we have so many activities. We have so many commitments. You feel it rising up. And some of you are going like, oh, can't we go back to lockdown so I can say, sorry, can't come. Right? We've been wrestling with this one with our children a little bit. Because we said to our kids, you kids, you have to choose what you're going to lose. You can't keep it all. You can't do it all. And so we have to change our and to an or. You know what I mean? So I, uh, our kids want to play night league basketball and do hockey and uh, uh, play an instrument and go to lessons and do school sports and activities and do church and youth group and kids ministry and, and, and. Anybody know what I mean? You feel it? Yeah, and. So we have actually said to our kids this year, listen, do you remember that feeling? That feeling when you come home from school and you just want to flop down on your bed and cry because you can't just relax at home today and do your homework and and, and just have a snack after school? You got to go, you got to go, you got to go because there's another thing to do. We're going to fight against that. And we're going to say that we're not going to do this and this and this and this. We're going to choose what we're going to lose. So what is it that we're not going to do? What is it that we're going to say no to because could doesn't necessarily equal should? And this has been something we're practicing in our family, and it's a way for you and me, us together, to fight distraction. It makes you narrow the focus and choose something, okay? You hearing me? Okay, second strategy of the enemy. Second strategy of your enemy when it comes to trying to stop you as you're getting close to the goal is that the enemy will try to discredit you. Discredit you. And 
I, I'm not sure how much time will allow me to elaborate on one particular area that I wanted to, to dive into, but I'm going to give you the gist of the storyline of Nehemiah and how it fits into this. And, and, and your enemy will try to discredit you in a couple of ways. The first way that we see here is that the enemy will try by spreading rumors about you, spreading rumors about you. Opposition always intensifies with impact. The more impact you have, the more, the more effectiveness you have, the more opposition that there will be. And here we go. Nehemiah is almost done. We're now into verse 5 and uh, 6 and then verse 7. And it says, then. So you've heard the storyline. They keep coming. Come meet me on the plain of Ono. Look, look at what it says here in verse 5. Then the fifth time. I mean, these guys are persistent. They've been coming. They've been coming. They've been coming. Then the fifth time, Sanballat said, sent his aid to me with the same message. And here's where it gets dirty. And in his hand was an unsealed letter. In other words, it's an open letter. It's a letter I'm writing to you, but I want everybody to read it. In fact, everybody already has read it from the plain of Ono to here. On the way, I made sure to tell everybody what's in my hand, in which was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true, good old Geshem, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore, you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king. Now, this report will get back to the king, so come, let us confer together. So now we've moved from distraction into discrediting Nehemiah. They're going to try and pull him out. They're going to try and get him to stop by fear, intimidation, and falsehood. And so here they come. They come right at him. And Nehemiah says, you know what? You're wrong. It's false. And he says to them, it's not true. And then what does he do? He prays to God and he keeps going. Friends, this is so simple but so hard. The replay goes on and on. We know. We talked about the voices in our head last week, didn't we? We, we know this replay. It goes on and on and on. And it's so difficult when people gossip about you, when people talk bad about you, when people question your motives. That's probably the hardest one for me. I, 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 just, I, just, I know that what we have to do is we have to say, don't worry about what people say, focus on what's true. But it is easier to say that from this pulpit than it is for us to live that out. I recognize that. But the enemy, in, in this storyline, we can clearly see what the enemy is trying to do. And sometimes just knowing that, we can go, not today, devil. Not today, enemy. It's not happening. No, you want to spread some rumors? I know that's one of your dirty tricks, but we're not going to, we're not going to give into that. We're going to pray, and we're going to keep right on going. We're going to focus on what is true. The second thing that your enemy will try to do to discredit you, and this one is very interesting, is, is he will tempt you to compromise. Give you all kinds of options to go sideways. So many options to, to destroy yourself, to damage yourself. Your actions can discredit you. So if he can get you to act in a certain way, that can actually discredit you. And so let's read on in Nehemiah's story and find this very interesting interplay where now it's not the outsider, it's not the insider, it's actually the religious that are trying to lead Nehemiah astray. Very interesting. So Shemaiah, who is a prophet, said, let us meet in the house of God. His hair's on fire. Ah, inside the temple. And let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. And then in verse 12, it says, Nehemiah writing, I realized that God had not sent him but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and then they would give me a bad name to what? Discredit me. The whole plan 
It was, a, it, was a, it was a devised scheme. One didn't work, the gears shift over here, and on we go. Let's find a way to damage Nehemiah's character. Let's discredit him. But some of you are scratching your head and saying, I don't get it. He just said, come into the temple, just close the doors and be safe. What was the storyline here? Well, there's a number of things, but the first one here is Nehemiah says, if I would have done that, it would have discredited me. Why? Because only the priests are supposed to go into the temple. When the doors are open, there's an invitation. When the doors are closed, it's only those who are the caretakers of the house of God who are there. And so for him to be there was to enter when only the priests should be going. And therefore, there would be this sense of what is Nehemiah doing? In fact, if you think about this concept for just a minute, your enemy will try to convince you that you are really more than you actually are. That you have a special license. There's an entitlement that goes with your responsibilities or your unique situation. The rules no longer apply. I can go into the temple. I am that important because the project needs me. The work of God will not happen without me. I'm here doing God's work. Why can't I go into God's temple? And th this, this interplay, this, this mental um, dialogue that happens for us, this internal dialogue that happens for us can happen in a number of places. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to push in just a minute here. Sometimes it's men and you're thinking about your marriage and you're saying, well, I have physical needs and they're not being met here, so I'll find another place to get them met. For women, they might say, well, my husband is not emotionally attentive, and this person is, so therefore I'll just enjoy that kind of affection. This is the kind of activity that we can talk ourselves into that brings us outside of what we might be responsible for, and they'll discredit our good work by our foolish decisions. I just discovered that a, a guy that I went to Bible college with years ago, who's been down pastoring churches in Florida has just been uh, charged, he was arrested and then, and then released on bail for stealing from two of the churches that he worked for. He had some elaborate scheme where he would buy Amazon books and then return them and keep the money. And he had, he had skimmed off like $30,000 from the church. And, and I'm, just bringing that, I'm just bringing that up to the surface, not to, not to shame the church or to shame the pastors in the ministry, but just to say this person was functioning with an unhealthy sense of autonomy and without accountability. Somehow he felt that the rules did not apply. I was shocked by this. And you can get into that same space. Well, I'm working late and they owe me and I'm going to, this is a personal expense, but I'm going to turn it in as a business expense. All of this can lead to your own discrediting because there's a sense of entitlement that leads to abuse of power that gives us permission in sexual temptation that causes greed to rise up in our lives. You see, much of our actions the enemy wants to play on in order to discredit us. Are you hearing me today? But Nehemiah made a decision. And Nehemiah said, oh, no, no, I'm not going out like that. No, 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 no. I'm not going to give up in the middle of this. That was the next thing he says. I'm not giving up. I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm not going to allow these circumstances to discredit me. Hey, Nehemiah, come into the temple. They're going to kill you. Come and hide here. But I said, should a man like me run away? Or should one like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. What was Nehemiah doing here? He's saying, no, no, no. That's not integrity. That's not character. That's not what got me this far. And I'm not going to allow the enemy's trick to work now. I'm functioning under a great cause. I have a great work that I'm doing and I'm rebuilding this wall, and I'm not going home until it's done. I'm not giving up until it's finished. I'm not gonna give up my good name. I'm not gonna give up my integrity. What am I gonna do, leave the people without a leader? As soon as I go in there to save my life, I discredit myself in front of the people, and Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, they win. They take authority away from me. They again abuse the people of God. No, I'm not doing it. 
I am not giving up. And so let's review. We've covered actually a lot of ground in the last four weeks. It's time to rebuild. We're in a rebuilding season. We started with Nehemiah where he said, I'm just going to mourn my losses and pray my prayers. Yes, I'm going to sit down and cry. I'm going to kneel down and pray, but then I'm going to stand up and act. And then we talked about how do you move from just having that kind of a burden into action. And we said we need internal courage. We need heavenly favor. We need participation with God's people. And then last week we talked about dealing with discouragement, just defeating discouragement. We said, Nehemiah, when he called the people to defeat that discouragement, he said, remember the Lord, remember the promises of God, fight for your cause, your God is good, he is able. And now today we're talking about dealing with the distractions. In some way, there's gotta be something that rises up inside of us that says, I'm not giving up. I'm not coming down. I'm not gonna give in to the distraction. I'm not gonna allow myself to be discredited. I'm doing a great work. I'm working with the Lord. I'm praying for my family. I'm interceding for my church. I'm leading that small group. I'm serving at youth ministry. I'm on the parking team. I'm one of the security guys on Sunday. I'm holding a camera. I'm turning knobs on a soundboard. I am doing a great work. I'm part of the rebuild and I'm not coming down and I'm not giving up. Amen? Nehemiah 6.15. So the wall was completed on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. Verse 16. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. You see, this part of the story ends with a testimony to the awesome, great power of God. And I want you to know, that's the goal in what we're doing. God gets the glory. God gets the praise that a church can thrive through difficulty, walk through a crisis, be shut down for 70 weeks, and in the process, finish one part of a remodeling project and start another, and God's people return, God's people gather, we worship the living God in freedom and in joy. Come on, I just want you to feel it today. God is the one who's gonna get the glory, amen? God is getting the glory. He's the one that gets the praise. It's all for him and it's all about him. This has been done with the help of our God. I need that story to be told in this city. There's no reason why the church should be thriving except for the help of God. And so we continue to live a testimony hey, there's, there's no, in this story, there's no miracles, there's no lightning, there's no talking donkeys. There's no handkerchiefs that have been prayed over with power. There's just a guy who decides that God's hand is long enough. His arm can reach. His strength is real and he can do it and we'll work hard. We'll come alongside of him. We'll believe and we'll persevere and we're going to see the day one. Amen? Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. I just, um, I just wanna kind of walk us through a time of prayer. And if you're watching online or if you're here in the room, I'd just like us to do this together. Just allow the Holy Spirit to come right now and, and speak to you. Would you just even, even welcome the Lord to come and to talk to you? Lord, we're still before you. We're quiet in your presence. We're reflecting in these moments. I just wonder if, if someone's here and you just sense that you're facing resistance, even as I talk about rebuilding, you're able to reflect on your own life, maybe there's an illness there, maybe there's an obstacle, maybe there's a sense of frustration about what you've tried and what hasn't worked. Maybe you feel like, I don't have what it takes to make a difference. 
maybe you're here today and, 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 and sort of through this whole season, there's been a loss of focus, almost an untethering of floating in the sea and, and maybe there's been pain, there's been hurt in your life. Maybe you've been gossiped about. Maybe you've been derailed by temptation. Maybe even right now today, listen, maybe today you're thinking about making a really bad decision. This could be the Lord right now. Don't do it. Don't come down. Don't give up. Just want you to hear the Lord in that. I just pray for those that may be facing that sense of resistance or that distraction or that pain or that temptation, frustration, obstacle. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name for the strength of God Almighty to come because, Lord, Nehemiah, in those times of weakness, in those times of challenge, he prayed and he kept going. So I pray for resilience. I pray for perseverance. I pray for strength. I pray for the the discipline to work hard, to say, God, you're not done yet. Lord, I want my life to be a testimony of your goodness. Touch me, Jesus. You know, I'm going to continue to pray. You may be here and and you're sensing with me this passion for the rebuild. You're thinking specifically about areas of your life, but you feel a very real opposition to the purpose of God in your life right now. Now, obviously, if you're at home, I can't have you raise your hand. But if you're in the house today, in the balcony or on the main floor, and you're saying, I'm facing a real opposition right now, and I need God's help, would you just lift your hand up? Because I want to pray for you. I see hands are going up in the room. God, thank you for those hands. And, and, And online, those people, you can lift your hand. Here I am, God. We're agreeing with you online here in the room. God, I pray in Jesus' name for those who are currently facing what they would consider a real opposition from the enemy. I pray for strength. I pray, God, that you would deliver them, that you would help them to overcome in Jesus' name. You would show them where victory is is for them and you would by your spirit lead them that direction. I pray Lord for those who are facing an opposition in their marriage. I pray for healing. I pray for coming together. I pray for unity and for peace and for healing in Jesus name. For those who are facing opposition in their workplace. Oh God I pray that you would in the place of opposition bring peace in Jesus name. I pray for those who might be facing this opposition at home whether it's with the kids or with the finances or or with the neighbors or whatever it might be, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would come, that you would bring your peace, that you would bring your help, that you would bring wisdom, direction, discernment, the strong hand of God upon their life in Jesus' mighty name. And now if you'll just stay with me one more moment as we continue to pray. I just believe, I believe with all my heart that there are some that are here today that are watching online right where you are and God is calling you to himself but you've been distracted by lesser things. I want you to hear the call of God today and respond to him. If you're here today and you don't have a life-giving relationship with your Savior, Jesus Christ, I want to invite you in to that relationship. If you're watching online, you can just click that hand that says, I want to give my life to Christ. If you're in this room, I just want you to know that you can whisper a prayer to your heavenly Father. You can invite Jesus Christ to come into your life, and he will come. The Bible tells us so clearly that Jesus stands knocking, wanting to have a relationship with us, wanting to come in, to be a part of our lives, to connect with us and and, and to love us, to literally save us, to offer us his salvation. Receive that today. Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, come into my life. In Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this story, this inspiration that comes from Nehemiah. Help us to be people of the rebuild. Help us to be those who have the strength and the capacity to see you re-begin your work. 
And Lord, bring strength, bring safety, and bring hope in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.